بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وصحبه اجمعين ما بعد قال عز وجل بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انما يعمر مساجد الله من امن بالله وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من بنى لله مسجدا بنى الله له بيتا في الجنه او كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي ثم اما بعد respected and honorable brothers and elders honorable mothers and sisters any community that wants to flourish anywhere a community wants to develop itself one of the things which has been established from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is he connected the community of the people around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he was on his way from the hijrah, we know from Makkah to Al-Mukarramah to Madinah to Al-Manawara, one of the things which he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did is he stopped off in Quba for a short amount of time. Those of you who have been fortunate to visit the blessed lands of the Haramain, you perhaps would have come across Masjid al-Quba, some people include it in part of the ziyara, but nevertheless it's a wonderful mashallah masjid that was built in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. the history behind it was when he was traveling from Makkah to Medina he stopped off in Quba for a few days and whilst that, in that duration whilst he was there he decided to not sit idle but rather build a masjid there as well so he didn't just pass time, but he used that opportunity to build a masjid, to build a place of worship, to build a place where people can congregate and take the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he went to Medina al Manawara, that was one of the first concerns which he had. How can we establish a base? How can we establish a center? How can we establish something for the community to gather therein? This is something, alhamdulillah, Muslims across the globe have been doing from since the beginning of Islam until now. And you can blatantly see the differences between communities wherein they have a fully functioning decent masjid and those communities that don't have any masajid at all. Yes, alhamdulillah, it's a privilege for us Muslims that we can build masajid and we thank Allah we're in. For, alhamdulillah for us, this is home and we can in our home we can build masajid. But we need to also think slightly out of the box a little bit as well and think how can we make those masajid really what they are buyutullah the houses of allah are houses of allah merely just to pray salah in are houses of allah just to hold the odd lecture in that in its place we're not negating that we're not saying anything negative about those things they are needed and they are a must and we must do although we should also be cognizant and we should also remind ourselves and think is the masjid limited to just this scope is it just limited to just this sphere where we just utilize it for prayers? Is it just so we can admire the, the Muslim showers, the pumps, the, 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 the tiles, the, the nice calligraphy on the walls? Where do, we, where do we stop improving the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it merely at the, at the mortar and the bricks and the carpet? So mashallah, the carpet is from Turkey, the calligraphy, someone came from Egypt, the marble came from India, and alhamdulillah, likewise, we built our masajid. Is this the pattern which we are following? Rasulullah sallallahu he mentioned from amongst the signs of the day of judgment people will start competing with one another in building of masajid people will start competing with one another in, in, in regards to masajid and he mentioned another hadith sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that from amongst the signs of qiyamah he mentioned that the masjid will be they will be built, they will look good, they will be lavish, they will be decent, they will be structured. But the people's hearts will be devoid of Iman and Taqwa. It's something, to, look, it's food for thought. We need to really ponder over this and really think. One side, Rasulullah he mentioned, Al Masajid Buyutul Muttaqeen. The houses of Allah, the Masajid are the houses of the pious. وَقَدَّمِنَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لِمَنْ كَانَتْ بُيُوتُهُمْ الْمَسَاجِدْ بِالْرَوْحِ وَالْرَاحَةِ Allah Ta'ala has taken it upon Himself as a responsibility for that individual who makes his house their house. 
whoever makes the house of Allah their house, what will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? He will give that individual comfort, tranquility. But it doesn't just end there. That is in terms of this world. People generally complain, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling upset. I get bombarded with calls and more so now that I'm becoming a counsellor more than ever. People phone up, marriage problem, this problem, depression, domestic violence, fighting, discord between husband and wife, the youngsters becoming atheists, the, the daughter has left home, run away. Subhanallah, our community are inundated with problems and we as Imams, I don't like to refer to myself as one, but in the light of the people, they husnul they refer to us as Imams and our phones by the Qasam of Allah are inundated with issues like this in our communities. So people complain, I'm depressed, depression I'm feeling down, I'm feeling depressed. Allah Ta'ala takes it, he, Allah is saying himself, what Rasulullah is saying, If you hold on to the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, number one, Allah Ta'ala will give you a rawh wa raha, peace and tranquility. Number one, this is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In addition to that as well, he also mentioned the things of Akhirah, the worry and concern which you and I have. How will you and I fare in the Akhirah? How will we go come across the bridge of Sirat? How will we enter into Jannah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned wal jawaz wa ala sirat ila ridwan rabbi tabarak wa ta'ala wa ila al-jannah. In addition to this as well, that individual that makes the house of Allah their house, it does not stop at a worldly sphere. It does not stop at a worldly base. It does not stop on the worldly, on the, on the worldly front. It it goes beyond this and transcend this. In the Akhirah, Allah will facilitate your crossing across the bridge of Sirat. In addition to that, you will enter into the Ridwan and the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ultimately into Jannah. A similar hadith is echoed as well, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he counts the number of people who will be fortunate to be underneath the arsh of Allah on the day of Qiyamah. He mentions, سَبْعَةٌ يُذِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ Seven types of people, Allah wa ta'ala will put them underneath the arsh of Allah. There will be no shade on that day except for the shade of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of those individuals is رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ That individual whose heart was forever and always attached to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his mithal and his example was what? كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا صلى الفجر جلس في مصلاه حتى تطلع الشمس حسنا he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mubarak habit was what? Whenever he would finish his fajr salah, this was the first thing he would do. He would remain seated in his place, he would not even move, and he would remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the until the sun has fully risen. It mentions in the hadith additional to this, this is separate from this hadith, that that individual that remains seated in their place of prayer, and then when the sun has risen, after the sun has risen, and we calculate it with approximately 15 to 20 minutes as a guide, that individual then performs two rakat of salah, that individual will get the reward of an accepted Hajj and Umrah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to emphasize this point, he stressed an accepted, an accepted, an accepted Hajj and Umrah he mentioned three times. These all things are in relation to what we can get out of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very sad, not that... We, we, we focus too much on the worldly pomp and show. Our masjid versus their masjid. Our masjid has the better facilities. Our masjid has the better this. And unfortunately, we fall victim to this as well. I, get, I got a phone call and now I'm very particular. I ask 101 questions. Why are you holding the program? Who's invited? What's going to happen? What's the protocol? People phone up. And what, I mean, one guy goes, we're holding a program. We want to, we want to call you for a speech. So take it by all means. Alhamdulillah, all and good is the deen of Allah. But anyway, and I was like, what, what, what encourages you to hold these programs. He goes, the result, what's happening is the local masjid, they're holding big, big programs. Don't only need to on it. So we like, we should also get a bit of the slice of the pie as well. And I said, brother, this is a really incorrect thinking. You're holding talks, you're holding programs so you can basically be in competition with the neighboring masjid. This is not the thinking of that ummah which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left this ummah upon. This was the more of the thinking of masjid dirar, Allahu Akbar. It's a long story and perhaps we don't know the history, but I'll just make ishara. There was a masjid that was built by people with 
a wrong motive who were part of the munafiqeen. They built a masjid just to create discord. Now, I'm not saying that we can go around and pass these fatawa. I'm simply saying, let's be a bit more conscious. Are we now falling into the same trap that we're doing things because now we are in competition with the other? In that case, we are those sad statistics which Rasulullah said, Inna min ashrati nas fil masajid. People will just, in the day of, toward the day of Qiyamah, will compete with one another in building masajid. But the masjids will be void and empty of Iman. The masjids will be void and empty of Hidayat. This thinking we have, Alhamdulillah, in our communities, mashallah, we do have this shawq, this trend, this raghba, this talab towards building the house of Allah. Alhamdulillah. But transcending this, going beyond this, we need to establish Islamic centers. What do we mean by Islamic centers? Model masajid, model mosques, exemplary figures that will hold, will shine bright in society. Our Salaf al Salihin, there's no shortage of people who held an attachment to the masjid. Sayyid ibn Musayyib, rahmatullahi alayhi, mentioned, now look, look, put yourself into the thinking for a moment. When we come to the house of Allah, masha'Allah, Jummah time, the masjid is packed, jam packed to the rafters. You can't even fit another person in. You know what I just said? It is ram packed. As you're on your way out, if you say to somebody, brother, are you coming next week for Jummah? He'll say, what sort of question is that? I'm not going to come for Jummah next week? Of course I am. In a lower voice, go to him and say, brother, next, are you going to come for Asr Salah? And he'll say, oh, make dua, make braz, come zor bandava. I'm very weak. Make dua, inshallah, inshallah, make dua. Traditionally, people do come to the masjid on Jumu'ah. And I'm not knocking that, that's a good thing, alhamdulillah. I'm not knocking that at all, it's something to be proud of. I mean, if, I, that was one thing I questioned my mum's family. My mum's revert, so I, I asked my mum's family, I said like, okay, you, you, you refer to yourself as Christians, but how many times do you diligently, religiously go to the church on a Sunday, perhaps? My family, I've got cousins that other than being christened, they never went back to the church. Or they, have, they got married in the church. Now that's up to them. We're not here to knock people. I'm just giving an example. So for us, that's a source of, we're proud of that, alhamdulillah. We do have people that come to the house of Allah. But are we falling in just that tradition, that thing that, okay, I've been to the masjid Friday, mashallah, tick the box and do one. A couple of years ago, I was on my way to Preston. We were musafir, so we stopped off in a local masjid, did our salah. It was Ramadan. We, obviously we was in a rush, so we had to do our fard and duck out, come out, and we wanted to get back on the motorway. So as we come out now, we jump in the car. Literally, as we parked up, one brother was in front of us. He come out, goes in the masjid. When we come out, he comes out with us. We're in the car park. We're in, literally just outside the masjid car park. And Ramadan, we start our car, he starts his car. But wallahi, what made me feel sad, and it made me think of this. We're not judgmental, we're not looking down upon anybody, we're not questioning people, it is Allah who will question. But if you turn on your car and the first thing that's going to pump is Biggie and Tupac, you think to yourself, what benefit did you just come and get from the house of Allah? Was it just that, okay, I've ticked my box, I'm a Muslim, Alhamdulillah. Many a people, they come for Jumu'ah because they think if I don't go for Jumu'ah, I'm done, I'm gone out of Islam. So it's like, let me go there, completely do my thing, go, and Alhamdulillah, I'm still a Muslim. Now, I'm, again, I'm not knocking that. I'm saying we need to improve. Let's, let's, let's talk about our faults. And let's see, uh, do I do that? Do I do that? I know Jumu'ah is half past one. Imam Saab will start the khutbah, bang on half past one. What time do I come into the masjid? 1.29.59. It's the one time of the week. If you don't have a regular attachment to the house of Allah, it was that one opportunity to come, listen, interject, bring something within, improve, go closer to Allah, internalize the message of Allah and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi And brothers, bichari, okay, fair enough, they come. What about our sisters? My mother never has until this day seen the inside of a masjid, till this day. When I was imam of a masjid, one of the things which I held was local program and I said, what we're going to do, we're going to arrange for sisters to come. Alhamdulillah, we put a complete section off. They had their own section. You come in from a separate door, their own wudu, their own toilet, everything. The people that opposed 
Well, our Muslim brothers, the, the, the Musallis in the front, how dare him do this? Where's this new thing can come from? Or they said, no, no, he thinks like that because he's half English. Well, Torah is not the For real, I'm telling you what I've experienced. This is not a joke. And it's sad to think like that. What have we made Islam? What this cultural, misogynistic, ruthless religion? Is that what we've made it? If we want to practice real deen, let's go back to what Rasulullah said. Let's go back to what the Sahaba said. <coughs> now, if we can cater, then a hundred, as we say, so bismillah, do it. Because believe you me, and it's uh, my phone rang more with sisters phoning than brothers. Allahu Akbar, it would really tear your heart when you hear the issues that our communities are going through. And these are things that are brushed under the carpet. What I'm saying is, alhamdulillah, living in England, living in where we are, we need to set the perfect example because we come with the perfect deen. We came with the perfect message. We've come with the best way of life. If we are not sure ourselves, how on earth are we going to tell this to other people? So I was saying, alhamdulillah, there is this trend. We do build masajid. But one of the things which I really, really feel really strongly for, yes, the fadail and the virtue are in their own place. You want to hear some virtues? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to the sahaba, ala adullukum ala, ala, I just mean to tell you something. That does what? Yukafir Allahu khadaya, Allah will forgive your sins and yazidu bihil hasanat and Allah will increase your hasanat and increase your rewards. Sahaba saying, go for it. We want to know, tell us what it is. He mentioned number one, isbaq al wudu ala al makari. Performing wudu, performing wudu, if the water is cold, the environment is cold, in this sort of thing you can kind of comprehend it a little bit more, right? Second thing, المساجد, the more steps you have to take to go to the masjid, this will be a reward for you. And last but not least, waiting for salah after the salah, وَإِنْتِذَارُ الصَّلَاةِ بَعْدَ الصَّلَاةِ Waiting for salah after the salah. Allah will do what? Wipe away, de wipe away sins, elevate you in your good deeds. Do we have that? 7.30 is Isha, what time? I don't know, I can't see behind me. 7.30 Isha. 7.30, bang on one, everyone jumps up. And like, Where's Molbi Saab? Where is he? Doesn't he know he takes £100 a week talha? Where is he? And everyone gets up and makes a commotion. These are issues that I'm here, look, look, I'm not here to sing nasheeds. I'm not here to say the law of the Quran. I'm going to say how it is. And the brothers know who, me, who I am for what I am. I'm not here to sing Kumbaya and make everyone smile. These are issues in our communities and we need to iron these out. Let's start with our house. When we're building this model masjid, what have we got in mind? What, simple masjid, simple, just a little madrasa? They are, look, I'm not knocking these things for God's sake. I'm saying these are extremely important, but there are so many things in addition to this that we can do. And if we do, we will make those masajid by the qasam of Allah moderate models, exemplary models for the whole of communities. For Jews, Christians, Sikhs, Hindus, atheists, everyone, they will say, if you want to learn something, that's the place you go. Where, what was the leading Muslim place in the leading Muslim university? Baytul Hikmah. Muslim university, Muslim colleges, they were the forefront. Look at the time of Banu Abbas, they, they bought those same models. Where they incorporate all these different things, education, knowledge, tahqiq and research, community issues, even mental health, Allahu Akbar, even within the masajid, even within the Islamic establishments. I'll, I'll, your, I'll move your attention towards something which is really a sad, I feel it's a very sad part of history. If you look historically, a lot of Muslims migrated from Arab lands in the early 60s. A lot of Muslims went to Australia. Um, a lot of Muslims went to, like you see a lot of Muslims in France and so on. But also funny enough, Brazil, South America. A lot of Muslims made hijrah and went to South America. Now, because, because of the culture of some of the cultures amongst Muslims, we feel if I'm Arabic speaking, that is sufficient for my child to practice upon deen. That because I speak Arabic, that is enough. I once went to hospital and I had a book in my hand which was an Arabic book, Ilm al a book on grammar, Arabic grammar. So I walk, I bowl into the, the, the hospital and the guy, he, he says hello to me and he says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And I say, I gave the salam back, I wasn't sure. And he said, do you speak Arabic? And I said, yes, I do. Fusha Arabic. And I was conversing with him on a basic level. He's Arabic, you can simply say in English, he brushed me under the table. I look like a Joey in front of him. His Arabic was that solid. Fusha Arabic, he was from Egypt. Anyway, engaging in conversation, he wasn't Muslim, he was Christian. He was Christian. Fair dues, his faith, it's up to him. Choose what you choose. 
Nevertheless, what I found was he spoke better Arabic than me, he had better Tajweed than me. But just on being able to converse, was that enough? Is that enough to be able to gain yourself the passport of Akhirah? Is that enough to gain, gain, gain your success in the Akhirah? Just being able to converse in Arabic. Because one of my colleagues, she's from Iraq, and she speaks better Arabic than me as well. I'm not saying I'm going to be successful, I don't know. The reality is, we don't know where we're going to end up. We can only have good hopes on Allah that He will take us with Iman and we can meet Allah on the day of Qiyamah in the condition of Iman. The reality is, we don't know. So we can't sit here with this superiority complex and think, because I've accepted now, I'm going to go with this same thing as well. We don't know for sure. We can just be hopeful of the mercy of Allah. Anyway. Getting back to my point about South America, a lot of Muslims went in the 60s and they made a census. Do you guys know what a census is, right? You should know, but every 10 years you get something come through your door and they kind of ask you how many people are in the house and how many, uh, how many work, what are the ages. Yeah, you guys know this, right? The census. It's, it's like we have part of our culture, part of our life here. Every 10 years or so it comes through. Then what happened was, is that at that time they compiled statistics and they said at that time there were 2 million Muslims in the country. How many? 2 million. Census after census after every 10 years it happened, but by 2000, this is, these were the shocking statistics. The statistics said that now there were only 60,000 Muslims. 60,000. Whereas here, Muslims came in the 60s and the, the ratio has been increasing year by year. There has been a steady increase. There was a decrease. What was the reason? Khair, did they did they just disappear? Did they just did they make hijrah back to their their original home countries? Did they go to other countries? The sad thing is, the sad thing is, 1.9 million people became murdad and they turned away from Islam. We I remember hearing this. Hafiz Badal Sab Rahmatullah was a great person of UK. Subhanallah, he passed away just a year before. And he was an, a really amazing person. He never had a Facebook page or he didn't have an email address even. He was just such a simple guy. But he rocked the hearts of people living in UK. So simple. And he had this fikr, Allahu Akbar. He would, I, I can mention that because he's not in our presence. He, I, he would engage in one to two hours to hajj, and he'd be making dua, crying and crying, making dua all the time. And his one concern would be, how can the ummah reclaim their lost glory? How can they come back to that original glory which they held? And he would be shedding tears and have this worry, global worry about Muslims. And which made him such an individual that he had this concern for every country. And so anyway, Khair is a long story. I don't want to go into his whole life here. Purpose of just touch upon. Anyway, he mentioned this. So by 2000, only now 60,000, where did they all go? Did they all vanish? No, they didn't. What happened? They left Islam. On this, he would shed tears and cry and wail and sob. Now, what's happened to the Muslim Ummah? But if you look historically, Muslims migrated in a great number to South Africa as well at the same time, even to England at the same time. In 1970, we went, I went to Blackburn. No, I wasn't born. In 1970, Muslims started going, but I went to Blackburn. And mashallah, I was in orderly range. And I asked one of the local ulama, and I said, do you have a lot of ha hafaz here? Ha half of the Qur'an, he said, Alhamdulillah, we've got loads. Just in orderly range, so you have wali range, orderly range, these are like areas, I can't say Reading, because Reading is a whole town. This is a portion of Reading, and I don't know how you divide or subdivide. Like, I'm from Crawley, we have Crawley Langley Green. So understand, for the guys who are with me, understand Langley Green. Small neighborhood, you know, consisting of only a few thousand houses. Anyway, khair, so orderly range, right? I was in orderly range, and I asked the brother, how many hafaz do you have? He said, Alhamdulillah, we started compiling a list. We started compiling a list. We reached 1,200 and we had to stop. We said, we can't do this. It's not possible, man. I mean, 1,200. And then they would say, oh, oh, oh no, no, there's this many. We, you know, we've come across more. Come, and they're saying there's more, there's less. They, when they got 1,200, they say, but Jazakallah, we can't do this. Ulama, people who have studied the Islamic sciences, they counted 750 ulama. In Batli, 300 ulama. Ulama, Allahu Akbar. People that have dedicated a portion of their life to study Islam in depth. And I've, I've mentioned this in countless places. And I'll mention to you though for some shawq, Allahu Akbar. This now, what happened was the same place. Alhamdulillah, we was there. We were fortunate to visit. Massive masjid. And you stand on top of the masjid. You can go, masjid, 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 masjid. You can count them. 
You can literally count them as a stone throw from each other. You do not have to walk more than a kilometer to get to another masjid. You've got to see it to believe it, really, no joke. That same place where we were, three floor masjid, thousands capacity, I was so overwhelmed to hear that that same place in the 70s, was this, this was their condition. I'm giving you some targhib so you can put it in context how people think, oh, we need to make hijrah to Blackburn. No, you don't. Make your Blackburn here. The same thing Hafiz Badal Sahib said to Malana Yusuf. It's a long khair. He wrote him a letter and said, I don't, I miss India. I miss, I want to come back. I don't want to stay in England. He said, you have to make your Dewsbury Nizamuddin now. You're there now. You, you make, make your mahal there. So he, he would walk eight miles, give da'wah, walk eight miles back. And that's what, mashallah, they did. Qurbani and Mujahada. So this Mawlana, he, he, was, he was telling us, he was saying, this is what, where you're sitting now, this is what it used to be. 1970s, we were all sitting down in the early 70s, and mashallah, we were waiting for salah, Imam Saab never turned up. Bichad, it will be insane, whatever the reason was, we don't know, they didn't disclose it, but the Mawlana didn't come, the Imam Saab didn't come. So one geezer walks in, mashallah, head to toe, wearing white, Imam, and they said, oh, mashallah, look, bro, Sufi Saab, like, man, put him on the musalla. He'll, so they put him on the musalla. you know, they looked at his outer thing, and they just assumed him to be a sheikh. So he gets on the musalla. they do the iqama, Allahu Akbar. Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbu kabi'a And they go <coughs> Surah Fatiha He went like this G In the salah In the salah G Like so Oh oh um, uh, Astaghfirullah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbi And then started the salah again Then That guy was telling the story but laughing He was saying this was our condition in the 70s we visited it, I visited there in 2000, I've been there a few times, but this was, what I'm talking about now is 2011. They, they, the statistics then, Yar, of 1200 Hufas, what's going to be the statistics now? That same place, in the morning when they have their classes finished, 250 girls all come out, mashallah, full hijab. I was, we were gobsmacked. Now look at the maho, look at the environment. Only in 30, 40 years this mahal and this environment has been created. It can be achieved. Everything can be done. It's where if you make effort, things will be done. I'll give you another card because I have another place in place in press and I've probably mentioned this dozens of times as well. And if this doesn't sh shake your iman a little bit, then well, yeah, I must well just get off the mic and give it to someone else. This masjid I went to in Preston, that was the, you know this Birmingham trip I was talking about? It was going on via to Preston. So now I, I go to this place now. Mashallah, big masjid, very nice, alhamdulillah. But the main effort, the main effort was not just the bricks and the mortar and the cement and the carpet. It was making effort on the hearts of the community. So it was Ramadan, it was a nice occasion, as you know, I mentioned Ramadan. And I've got this habit, I like to always go around massage, have a look, you know, what, you, what are you doing, what are your activities? It gives me a bit of an inspiration so we can relay the information to the Ummah. And he said this, he, sh he showed me this one room, as soon as Isha Salah, they had simultaneously different jama'a, different congregations taking place. Now just for argument's sake, imagine this, so upstairs you've got one room here, two, three, four, and then you've got the main jama'a. How they divided it was someone, for example, in the first 15 days, they do one khatam of Quran. So if then if you want to go for i'tikaf or perhaps you want to go in Umrah or you want to go and visit some, some sheikh's majlis or you want to just do some da'wah activities or you want to get involved in some community work, then at least you can do one whole recitation of the Quran. So they would do 15 days, 15 days. One group, one thing was as soon as Isha entered at 1042, Boom, they would start their Salah 1042. So anyone with the excuse of work or old or weak, they just get it over and done with quickly. I know it was quick reading as well. Not ya'lamun ta'lamun, but it was really relative, relatively quick. So like this, just I'm not going to go through each one because I'm going to exhaust my time. Like this, there were four different gatherings and then the main one downstairs. And then he said to me, we allow only maximum four regards per hafiz. Now, is anyone here good at maths? There's five gatherings, each one with five hufaz. What is that? 25. So I said to him, Ra Hafiz Saab, man, you lot smashed it, bro. 25 hufaz. He goes, Alhamdulillah, they're the ones that are here. And I was like, okay, so how many have you got? And this was again going back how many years ago? 
and I've got, I'm gonna actually phone him and get an update of how many there are now. I'm saying an old statistic. I'm not doing justice. But the reason why I say the same statistic is because I may have mentioned this before in this recording. Someone will say this geezer's chatting garbage, bruv. I mean, he's saying there to this many, this many. He's just making it up as he goes along. So I'm gonna make sure that this clip goes online so people can see. Ah, that was only oh, all. This is all jadid. You know, you have the fuqaha. Anyway, khair, these are technical concepts. My man. Anyway, let's go back to his story. I said to him, 25 hufas, mashallah, your masjid has 25 hufas. He goes, nee, nee, Molbi Saad, ye voyage of mujood there, these are those that are here. I'm like, okay, so how many have you got? He goes, alhamdulillah, with the grace of Allah. From our masjid alone, we have graduated minimum 250 hafiz of Quran. So, bhai, hum nahi kar sakte hain? Kya hum apne bachon ko hafiz nahi bana sakte hain? We cannot, can we make our children do the same thing? Can we make, why don't we get the best of both worlds? Why not? It's our communities thinking like this. Mashallah, Gujarati thinking is slightly different from our perhaps different in other, other cultures. They make it must. You will be attached to the deen and then they, you know this thinking that if I'm attached to deen, what's gonna happen to my dunya? Well, they've got much more money than our communities have. And good on the brothers, mashallah, I've got full respect because they have understood the importance of deen and dunya both. 250 hafiz of Qur'an, 250. A friend of mine called me as well to go to a gathering. This is in Walcombe, so Balki, mashallah, I just got a text as well, just after Salah. So they're fundraising for their masjid as well. Alhamdulillah, he called me to go to his daughter's graduation of Qur'an, and I was really surprised to hear, mashallah, his daughter, listen carefully guys, for the girls as well. I mention them because they're sisters here. This is not a, a monopoly for men, no. Sisters can do this as well. He phoned me up and said, I want you to come to the gathering. We've got Hafiz al Quran, Qari Ziyad Patel is coming, Mona Abdul Rahim Sahib is coming, this person's coming. So, cool, but no problem at all. What's the occasion? The occasion is Hafiz al Quran, my daughter finished Quran. MashaAllah, how old is your child? Listen to what he said. My daughter is only six years old. This is in the streets of Walthamstow in London, Leytonstone. This is not in Makkah or Medina. This is not in perhaps. In, 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 in Cairo, in the outside Azhar, in front of Ain Shams or whatever, this is in London. So for you to say, I can't do it, bruv, we're in Reading. If I was in my country, it would be, a where's your country? You've been here for 30 years, it's still not your country? When are you gonna get out of this Jahil Bendu mentality that this is your country as well? And that's what a lot of it boils down to. And forgive me if I come across harsh. If we do not look at this as a home, rules will be made, laws will be passed because it's not your home. This is home for us. We need to be able to bring our Islam in the public life in such a way where people say, is that really Islam? Is that what it's all about? And people will see the beauty of Islam. We've secluded it just merely to prayers. Even the concept of having an open date is alien to a lot of communities. How do we, some people must have 40 years have been established, they've not even had one open date. And I'm saying this with a great heavy heart because I feel very sympathetic, empath, empathic as well to a lot of non-Muslims because they're wonderful people and they have the right to know what Islam really is as well. Okay, we're not here to monopolize. We're not here to turn everyone into Islam because Hidayat is in the hands of Allah, but don't they deserve the right to know really what Islam is about? Shouldn't we make them feel comfortable around us? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one person came into Masjid Nabawi. He was a captive, so they tied him up on one of the satoons, on one of these pillars. In that three, before he tied up, he said, you know what? Of all the people walking on the earth, I hate Muhammad the most. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I hate him the most. That's what he said. Tied him up for three days. They were feeding him, looking after him. What did that guy see? Did he or I, did he see, mashallah, beautiful marble lights, bakhoor burning, mashallah, big, big thobes and... Because the Sahaba weren't very well dressed. They never had a lot of money. The roof of Masjid al-Nabawi was date palm. The floor was stone. It mentioned when it rained, we would make sajda and we would see the athar of mud on our foreheads. But wallahi, by the qasam of Allah, the houses were empty, the masjids were empty, but they were brimming with Iman. Ours are flip side. Our houses are full, our masjids are lavish, but by Allah, our masjids and our homes are empty from Iman. Three days was tied up. 
He was just observing. He saw the a'mal taking in the masjid. Education, dhikrullah, ta'aleem, khidma, all these beautiful things happening under one roof and was inspired. After three days, he says, I have an announcement to make, I, if you can untie me. He raises his hand. <coughs> And he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu number one. You know, before three days, this man Muhammad, I hated him the most by the qasam of Allah. After three days, he is the most beloved person to me walking on the face of the earth. After three days of seeing the mahal of the masjid, being in that environment, looking at the akhlaq of the Muslims. Have our masjids become power struggles? Fighting for kursi? For chair? Okay, who's going to be the chairman? Who's going to be the secretary? Who's going to be the treasurer? We all want a good functioning masjid, but we're not ready to put that same effort in. I've still not spoken about the Brazil thing. That's hanging still. So as I mentioned, I'm coming back to that point and tying up the loose ends. In Brazil, unfortunately, how many people became murtad? But in South Africa and England, people stayed on deen. Why? What is the reason why? Is it just merely masajid? No, I demonstrated and told you those communities where an education was a must, you see the difference between them communities and others. And we've been. You go to those communities where masjid is weak, activities are weak, education is weak. Wallahi, the community is weak. But those places, mashallah, where the effort is strong, people are strong, Activities are strong, the community is strong. Some of the things which people are proposing for masajid, youth advice, careers advice, things like multi, multi-faceted classes, but in a haphaps tuition, get the best of both worlds. Islamic knowledge as well as, I don't know this word secular knowledge because all knowledge comes from Allah. Let's just say worldly knowledge then perhaps. But we need the best of both. We need the, I'm not, you know, when we sit here, we're not advocating that everyone needs to leave their jobs or everyone needs to leave the thing and just sit in the masjid and become vagabonds and malang and Allah, 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 and just forget about the dunya. That, that's not part of deen. It's, a, it's not the deen, it's a part of deen. It's fit in there. Like Rasulullah says, he specified a time for dhikrullah. He specified a time to be with the wives. He specified a time to talk to the sahaba. He specified a time to do X, Y, and Z. He was a warrior. He was a leader. He was a husband. He was a son-in-law. He was all those things. He was that thing at his particular time. People have this misconception. If my child goes in the lines of deen, where on earth is he going to eat roti from tomorrow? What, do you think Allah has become so weak that He can't provide you two roti to eat, two, a plate of rice to eat? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon Who's going to provide for us in Jannah for millions and millions of years? No job, no business, no occupation, no knowledge and know-how, Allah will provide. Can that same Allah not provide now? So as I mentioned some of these things, community engagement, how important, dawah activities, interfaith work. How about counselling, marriage services? How many of our young Muslim youths are out there doing haram because they can't find a spouse? Because a boy can't find the right girl, the girl can't find the right boy. Let's facilitate these necessities in our community. Let's start this, the discussion how we can improve it. I haven't come here with all the solutions. Each one of these has a solution. And I can't do justice in a 40 minute lecture. But these are some of the ideas to kind of tickle your taste buds. So does it make you think, think out of the box a little bit. To think our community needs all these different things. How about things like media engagement? How about access for dis people with disabilities? How many people we have in our community that have issues, troubles at home? Husband and wife issues, things of health, mental health. All these things are those things that would take place in the, in the masjid in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Health and fitness, mashallah, this is becoming a lot more common, so I'll give that. A lot of people are having football classes and so on. Alhamdulillah, good on you, carry on. But there is a hell of a lot or many, many a thing additional to what we are currently doing, which we need to implement in our communities. But this is the dilemma as well. And by the way, just for the record, I'm not an imam. I'm not a Mulbi in a masjid. I don't get paid for leading salah. So don't think I'm singing, I'm saying this to get a bit of sympathy. Because I'm not doing that. I run my own madrasa, thankfully. Alhamdulillah. Not that there's anything wrong with being an imam. But you and I, in our community, we are guilty of the fact of what? Where we've 
treated these people like wallahi that with them once you become an imam your life thereafter is finished you have no future prospect after that why is it the creme de la creme of our ummah do not choose to go into imamat and be religious scholars and religious leaders why because we pay them qasam by allah less than we pay a toilet cleaner we pay them less than what you would pay for someone to fix your toilet after it's been blocked at home we pay them less than paying those individuals that pick up our scraps from the floor outside on the streets. We pay them less than that. And these are supposed to be the people that are to safeguard the ummah? What credibility, do they, what have we given these individuals? Now you may say, well, they did not study for this purpose. Fair enough, they didn't. But should we take advantage of that? That because of their good intention, we take advantage of that. Should we do that? No. Rather, we should be a bit sympathetic and think, hold on, these are people that selfless, selflessly have given themselves to the communities. Okay, I'm not saying pay them like the CEOs of the big organizations. At least pay a living wage. At least pay a suitable so that the man doesn't worry, where am I going to get my next bill to pay for? And the, guys, these are realities. We travel up and down the country and I'm only saying what I see. We want all these services. How are you going to provide for them? We're happy to spend a million pound on I don't know how much is being spent here. I'll talk about my own local area and this I'll say openly. Three million pounds we spent on one masjid, one and a half million on another. Pull the resources together, that's four and a half million pounds over two masjids. Pay someone 15,000 pounds a year for 10 years. They can just work 15 hours a week. Let them be a marriage counsellor for 10 years. They will sort out the affairs because when things go pear-shaped in our community, we don't just stop at a few verbal things, we shoot one another. Our family, our communities get involved in honour violence. They're ready to kill one another. That's what we're badnam for, right? Because we have to show our badmashi. How can we let them get away with that? We're going to look zalil in the community. You know, subhanAllah, I'll finish off on this one incident. That when Hilako Khan ransacked Baghdad, and Musta'zim was basically taken as prisoner, and he asked him, what, You've got all this money, you've got a, a door made of gold, you've got this, this, these massive wooden carvings. What did you do? Why, why was you hold, hoarding all this? Wouldn't it have been better for you to take off that door, cut it into small coins and pay your people decently? They would have served you to the death, but when they saw us coming, they ran like sheep. Because when, they hit, when things hit the fan, no one's going to stay around. They're going to say, you, your business, mate. And I find it, wallahi, a borderline miracle that despite the odds being against some people selflessly, despite that they give themselves to their communities. I can only say those things to those individuals, those imams, those da'is, those religious scholars, your reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't expect reward from anybody else, you're not going to get it. But is it our duty or not? We should think differently. Okay, we're not looking to pay 100k, 200k, but come sick and make the geezer's life a bit easier, right? Now, if that's a bitter pill to swallow, I don't care. That's reality. And we need to think out of the box on these lines. So all these things I'm talking about, and actually someone sent me a wonderful picture I'm reading off of that. 21st century model British masjid. Well, fantastic. If we can achieve those things. And he mentions at the bottom, the list is not exhaustive. So don't just think what I've mentioned now and what I failed to mention. There's a whole host of things. You have to look at what your community needs. And accordingly, inshallah, we need to make effort. So I'll just finish off on this one point. My purpose is not to rant and rave. My purpose is not to find faults. We've got a lot of good in our communities. Alhamdulillah. I gave you the example of Preston, how many hundred of us, Batley, Bolton, all these places. We should bring that alive in every masjid. We should bring that alive in every place. We should bring that alive in every community. Aspire for deen. Allah will take care of your dunya as well, inshallah. By sab samaj ke kya keh raha Yeah? Inshallah, who will inshallah, make, try to make intention, make at least one, one child half of the Quran, inshallah. Allah will give you the best of deen and dunya. Some of the hands that haven't gone up, I'm not going to say, raise your hands. I hope you've got intention in your heart. Try to get the best of both. Give your children the best of both. And inshallah, Allah will provide you with raha and comfort in this dunya, in qabr and akhirah. Wallahi, you will thank me for this and your nasr will thank me for this as well. So I finish off on this note. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to make amal and practice on the good that was mentioned. Anything which I said perhaps was a little bit out of my forte, it wasn't appropriate. I ask Allah for forgiveness. And if I've offended anyone on a personal level, then forgive me for the sake of Allah. Nothing was malicious, nothing was ill intended. So we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He give us the ability to understand these words inshallah, practice and implement them. And as we've gathered here today, 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it such that we go with Iman and He gather us inshallah in Jannah al Firdaus inshallah. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.